Hi, I'm Anna Raimondi, coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut, um, with a new episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. And today we have a wonderful guest whose name is Jeff O'Driscoll. During his 25 years as an emergency physician, Jeff O'Driscoll saw souls leave their bodies at death and communicated with them. His otherworldly experiences began in childhood after his brother died in a farm accident. After decades of silence, he now shares his experience in his award-winning book, Not Yet, and as an international transformational speaker. After stepping away from his clinical med medicine, Dr. O'Driscoll now serves clients in 10 countries, working as an intuitive mentor, connecting each soul to their highest self and their most authentic life path. Well, that's a lot, especially from a medical doctor. So thank you it's for a being on. a switch. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, so thank you for being on today. Um, so I just need to ask you, what kind of experience did you have in the emergency department, in the emergency room that kind of led you on your path? I had experiences in the emergency department that uh, I never heard about in medical school and that science couldn't explain. Sometimes when uh, a patient would die, I'd actually see their soul or their essence, uh, their spirit, if you will, leave their body, and they'd communicate with me before they left. And uh, sometimes I'd get uh, intuitive messages about caring for patients. Uh, I never spoke about it during my, during my career in the emergency department, but uh, after I stopped seeing patients uh, in the ER, I, I felt like it was okay to share some of my experiences. So now I talk about them more. So you never shared this with your colleagues? No, there was one nurse in the emergency department who had similar experiences. And uh, uh, she told me about some of her experiences and, and, and pried some of mine out of me, but she was the only one that I ever talked to about these things while I was still practicing. So what are some of your experience? What did, what did you say? What did you feel? Well, for example, on one occasion, uh, a gentleman was involved in a really serious car crash in central Utah, and he was uh, stabilized to the extent possible at the local hospital and then flown to my facility where it a major trauma center. When I went into the trauma room, he was unconscious on the gurney and a bunch of people were providing his medical care. There were other doctors there. And standing above him in the air was his deceased wife who had died in the car crash. Uh, um, I never knew him or his wife in life, but uh, I met her uh, after his death and she was uh, thanking me for the care that he was receiving. Um, and, and I subsequently became good friends with that man. We're still friends today, 25 years later. So how did that work for you? Like, like all of a sudden this is happening. How did you accept that? Was it difficult? I mean, as a medical how doctor? How does it work? That's a good question. I don't know how it works. Um, from a medical perspective, uh, sight is very simple. It, well, not simple, but the way it's understood is that you have electromagnetic waves that come through your pupil and your and your lens and focused on your retina where they're converted to electrical signals by the rods and cones. And they travel down your optic nerve to the occipital cortex that interprets them into an image. That's how sight works from a medical perspective. But when I'd have my experiences in the emergency department, like when I described to you, it was as if all of those uh, anatomic and physiologic processes were, were bypassed and I just got the pure unadulterated image in my mind. It felt like I was seeing it through my eyes, but there was something more profound to it. Is it like an all knowing to you? Do you feel it like deeper than your eyesight? Yes, it's much more powerful than physical sight. And, it, and it's almost always accompanied by this profound, as you say, all knowing. You, you have this understanding of what's going on. Uh, I, would, I would experience things in con context. For me, I had that experience with that woman that that man and his wife it was like the room got quiet for me everybody else did what they were doing went on with their usual activities but for me it got quiet and time slowed down and when I w walked over and looked down at the patient I could still see his wife standing behind me in the air because I could see in all directions at the same time so things that are not easily explainable in this realm 
Did you have that experience before you had that with him? Did you have it after your brother passed? My brother died in a farm accident just a month before my 12th birthday. And it wasn't long after that that uh, I started getting uh, messages. I didn't think that his death had had a major impact on me, but it must have because shortly after his death, I started getting messages. And as time went on, the messenger messages would get more clear and uh, more profound. And then sometimes I started to see the messenger. And so by the time I went to medical school and when I uh, was working in the emergency department, I'd been having these experiences for decades and they felt normal and natural to me. So why come out now? Why are you sharing it now? Oh, about six months after I stopped seeing patients, one day I just woke up and something clicked in my soul and it felt like it was the right time to share. And so I, I talked with a few trusted friends about some of my experiences when I, and when I saw how it, it touched them in some way, it, it validated some of their own experiences that they might've kept to themselves as well. And, and I, I, I saw the value in sharing with people. And so about six months later, I'd written my book uh, and a friend of mine set up my first public speaking engagement. I went to the airport with a bag full of books and I, I was sitting in the lounge waiting for my flight. And this young couple sat down next to me. This woman uh, asked me where I was going, what I was going to be doing and the usual airport questions. And when I told her what I was going to be speaking about, she just got this really sincere look on her face and she said, my grandfather just died and he's come to me a couple of times. And I initially thought, why would you, why would you share something so intimate with a total stranger? Ironically, that's what I was thinking as I was getting on a plane to go talk about my own experiences. Uh, but uh, then I realized, Oh, I'm a safe place. She knows I'll believe her. But and also so, I think that the universe brings us together with these people that we can help. Yeah, I think it does. I think the universe puts us where we need to be. Yeah. So then what do you say to skeptics? Oh, nothing. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't worry about skeptics. I don't have anything to prove and I'm not trying to convince anybody. So yeah, if they too. ask me sincere questions, I answer their questions. And if they are skeptical, that's, that's, they're, that's fine. I don't, that doesn't bother me. Right. So tell me about your book. What did you write about? I wrote about some of these experiences in the emergency department and how they impacted me and and uh, some of the experience I had outside the emergency department too, because I'd have a lot of experiences in a lot of different uh, settings. You know, it's so interesting. When I was writing conversations with Mary, one of the questions I asked her is like, why? Like you're coming through to so many people in the United States that are medical professionals. And it's because we, we respect our medical professionals. We don't think that they're like in woo-woo land. And so if a medical professional comes out like you or Eben Alexander, or even Dr. Moody, you know, who is very well respected, we tend to follow them. And so the universe is setting us up saying, hey, you don't wanna follow like the other people that you think, oh, we will listen to these people because they're coming through. And you are like, I mean, I don't wanna say the chosen few, but you're the courageous ones that are coming out in the middle of like the medical profession. So how did your colleagues like, what do they think about like what you say? I have one or two colleagues that are warm to it and even have shared some of their own experiences with me. Others are probably indifferent. And if there's some that are hostile, they haven't spoken to me. So I'm not sure about that. But I didn't speak about these things until after I stopped practicing medicine in the emergency department. So I don't see a lot of those colleagues anymore. But, you know, Evan's a good friend. Uh, so, so is Raymond Moody. In fact, when I wrote my book and when I first spoke about my experiences, um, I got a call from Raymond Moody, whom I'd never met. And what I didn't know when I took care of that guy in the emergency department was that I later found out because uh, we became friends before he was extricated from the car, before he was ever flown to my facility, he left his body and he met his deceased wife in the air above the accident. And she said, you have to go back and raise our other son because his 14 month old son had passed in the, in the accident and his seven year old son was minimally injured. So 
he and I are still good friends today. And Raymond Moody called me up after he had heard me talk about my experience with this friend of mine, Jeff Olson. And he said, for 40 years, I've been a skeptic. I've been a, a detached, objective uh, researcher. And he said, after I heard your experiences at, with Jeff Olson, I gave up my skepticism and I truly now believe that there is life after death. Now that's, that's what pretty, Raymond Moody said to me. That's pretty amazing. So why do you think you, why do you think you are, why do you think you have a voice to this? Uh, because there's all kinds of uh, researchers and professionals out there that postulate different mechanisms for near-death experiences. Um, and I know a lot of those researchers. They talk about anoxic brain injury and temporal lobe seizures, uh, hallucinations, drug-induced uh, 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 artifact, and things like that. But nobody has proposed a mechanism for my experience. I was wide awake in the middle of a shift in the emergency department. I was on no drugs. I have no history of any kind of seizures or mental illness. And I had this profound experience where I see people outside of their bodies and have these tr spiritually transformative experiences. And then I go on to my next patient and complete my shift and go home. Um, so the fact that I was not unconscious or on medication or or having some other explanation for my experience, it kind of defies the, the uh, explanations of science. And I don't know what to say about it. Do you think your brother helps you with this? Yes, I know my brother does. Uh, he, I didn't think that my brother's death had a big impact on me. I thought I got through it unscathed. And uh, 20 years later, my brother came to me and he said, you have to go talk with our mother because there's things she's never told you about my death. So I went and sat down with my mother. And she told me that day for the very first time, I always knew where you were in the house before Stan died, she said. After your brother died, you stopped singing. She said, I always knew where you were in the house before Stan died because I could hear you singing. But when your brother died, you stopped singing. And so I know that it had a big impact on me. And I know that my brother's visits to me on a few of occasions have uh, given me direction to, for the next step. Do you sing now? Do Are I you, what? Do you sing now? Occasionally. You, you need to sing. You need to think because it brings him forward as well. So your message like to the world, like why you're stepping out, why you're doing this, what is your overall message? Well, sometimes I had these experiences in the ER where I'd see people outside their bodies. But on one occasion, I had a similar experience with somebody not being out of their body. I went in to take care of a homeless gentleman. It was about this time of year. There was snow on the ground. He'd have been out walking around in the snow. He had sh holes in his shoes and holes in his socks. And uh, he had long, unwashed hair and a scraggly beard, struggled with substance use. And I went in there to take care of him. Um, I knew what needed to be done. He knew what needed to be done. We didn't even really say much to each other. I filled a wash basin with warm water and squirted some soap in it. I grabbed a wash rag and sat down at the foot of the gurney and I took off his shoes and the last threads of his socks and I washed his feet. And something profound happened. Everything that was mortal or physical about him was drawn aside and I saw his soul. I saw who he was. And I understood I was in the presence of the divine. Yeah, because isn't that Christ-like? Washing the feet of the master? No matter how the master appears to you? Yeah, I thought I'd gone in there. I thought I'd been there to serve him. And I realized he was there ministering to me because mm -hmm. he was teaching me who I was. And I understood, I understood that no matter where you are, whether you're in the pews in church or in the gutter, the person next to you is always divine. And oh. you're divine. Yeah, I think it's people recognizing the divine spark within themselves and other people. But that's a beautiful story because it calls to Easter, you know, when Jesus's feet were washed, you know, and, you know, Judas said, don't waste don't waste the the oil it's precious oil you know and it's like 
You know, it is what it is. There's going to be a lot of poor people, but it's okay. It's okay to honor. It's okay to honor the divinity in each other. So that's yeah. really beautiful. And you bring that to other people, which is even more beautiful. Uh, since that day, I viewed every soul that I've met differently than I viewed them before that day. That's absolutely beautiful. So what message do you have to give to like my audience, to the people out there who are looking to, I want these experiences or I want to, I want to feel this. I want to go there. What can you say to them? I was preparing to speak to a large group once a few years ago, and I, I take it very seriously. I try to get connected and centered and, and quiet. And, and, and I asked, I said, what is the message? What do you want me to share? And the voice that spoke to me said, tell them they're enough, tell them they're divine, tell them they're loved. And that's really yeah. all there is to it. Isn't that all there is to it? You are yeah. enough, you are worthy, you are divine, you are loved. Yeah. And I don't think people really always feel that way because they're judging themselves against the standards that we have in our world. That's beautiful. So you share that in your book? Actually, that came after the book was written. So are you writing another book that that's going to be in? Yeah. Well, I, I am. I am writing again. I, I, I did write another book that's mostly sitting on my computer. I haven't felt the inclination to edit it and publish it yet. And earlier today, I was working on my next novel, which uh, is getting close to going to print. Yeah, I kind of feel like you need to get more out there, whether it's a novel form or what or self help or whatever it needs to be done, um, because you have a platform that people will listen to. You know, and I think that you bring through so much, you know, as a medical doctor who can talk about things that you saw in the emergency room or in even in life. You know, we all have something to give. We all need to write a book, but some of us have a bigger platform for it and you need to kind of get it out there. You're, it's pretty great what you're doing. Well, I'm working on getting it out there. I was, somebody was pushing me hard to do a YouTube channel once or do podcasts and I was kind of reluctant. And one day I was kind of debating it in my mind and I heard my little timid voice say, but what if my message isn't good enough? And then I, and then I heard the voice that I'd recognized for decades speak up and say, it's not your message. That's right. And that's and what I tell uh, everybody. When people say to me, how do you stand in front of a thousand people and speak? Because it's not me standing there. It's not my message. I'm just the holograph that God works through. And I feel like if you take yourself out of your ego and you put your ego over there and you become the hollow bone and let God move through, move through it, there are no questions. It just happens. Yeah, it was a good ego check for me. So about yeah. three weeks later, uh, spirit woke me in the middle of the night and I couldn't go back to sleep. Uh, a couple hours later, I finally asked, I said, why did you wake me up? And the voice said, I've given you messages. Why aren't you sharing them? Yeah. So that's when I started doing my blog posts on my website. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what Mary did for me. Mary would wake me up in the middle of the night. I have to get up, sit up. My, and I'm not you don't wake me up in the middle of the night. I I am cranky. Um, she'd wake me up in the middle of the night. I type what she was saying. I go back to sleep in the morning, put questions to it, because that's when we're most vulnerable. That's when we're not overthinking and not in we're not over um, like if we're not in the cerebral, we're not, cere you know, we're not, we're not thinking through it. You know, we're kind of in that place where we just like have it happen, yeah. but, um, you've well, come a long quiet. way to get to that place, you know, um, being in that quiet place and being able to receive and giving up the ego around that was hard. It's hard for people who are overly educated too. You know, like, I know this, I know this, I know this. Like, what do you mean? Like, you're going to come through me and tell me something that I'm not sure of? What do I do with this? But as long as you're opened up to it and you're able to bring it to the forefront, you will have people listening to you. And that's what's so important. Really important. So I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be with you today. I'm honored to be a part of your journey. What is the name of your book again? The book is Not Yet. And people and can get it on Amazon? It's on Amazon. If they want to go to my website, they can get it domestically on my website. I don't ship internationally, but you can get it anywhere in the world through Amazon. 
and you can get it domestically through my website. My my first novels on my website. People can buy it there if they want. There's even. So what is your novel about? My novel is about a guy that was brought brought that grew up in such an abusive environment that he was totally broken, and uh, and hated life and and the world. And then something happens to him where he finds a new path, and it's it's really a spiritual journey for him. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really nice. So um, for all of you out there who um, would like to read, um, you know, the novel, The Self-Health of Jeff, Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll, you can certainly go on to Amazon. You can go to his website as well. Um, what is your website address? Helpingsoulsheal.com. Oh, that's so nice. So helpingsoulsheal.com. Um, thank you so much um, for being on today. From my heart, I thank you and thank to all of you out there who have listened to this. Um, you can always listen to this over and over and over again by going onto my YouTube channel or SoundCloud. Um, but once again, Jeff, thank you so much for being on. Namaste. Wonderful to be with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you.